All right, we're glad that you all have made it on this snowy morning. It's really beautiful outside, but I understand we're probably going to have some less people. Although for Sunday school, this is pretty good size, so I'm glad you have joined us. And I'll go ahead and start with the word of prayer, and then we'll dig into the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word for this morning. I pray that you would keep our, our people safe this morning as we drive. I pray that you would bring the church together as many as we can to worship and glorify and, and learn and be edified this morning. I pray that you would give us an enjoyable time and a time that is moving and, and truly glorifying to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, at this point in our study in Sunday school, we have completed all of Paul's letters except for his pastoral epistles. And the pastoral epistles are the books of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And these are grouped together because Paul wrote them to two young pastors um, to instruct them as they engaged in ministry. And they were written about the same time near the end of Paul's ministry. So over the next three weeks, we're going to consider these books. And I would encourage you, even if you're not a pastor, to not zone out. Because these books are for you. They contain a large amount of instruction, even though they're meant for pastors. And if everyone who's not a pastor is zoned out, I would just be talking to JD. And that's not the point of this class. So please, uh, these books are for you. And today we're going to discuss 1 Timothy. And this book is the first letter that Paul wrote to uh, the, the man Timothy. And we're first introduced to Timothy in Acts chapter 16. He's described as a young disciple who's well spoken of by other believers, and he joins Paul on that second missionary journey in Acts 16. He was from the region of Galatia, and his mother and grandmother were both Jewish believers. So he had been instructed and raised in the scripture and then came to faith in Jesus Christ. His father was a Greek, so he had a Jewish mother, a Greek father, which meant that he was likely looked down upon by both Jews and Greeks. The Jews didn't like him because he had a Greek father. The Greeks didn't like him because he had a Jewish mother. So he was kind of caught in between in the racial system. But Timothy proved himself to be a faithful minister in the service of Paul, and he assisted Paul in establishing many churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Ephesus. And he was with Paul when he wrote the letters of Romans and 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. So Timothy was really involved in the ministry of Paul specifically, but also just in the establishment of the church in the first century. So Timothy was with Paul when he wrote Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, which means that he was with Paul for at least part of his imprisonment in Rome. And after <clears throat> Paul was released from his imprisonment, Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to oversee the church there. And we see in 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So Paul established Timothy in the city of Ephesus while Paul went off to visit other churches to evangelize and encourage. And he said, Timothy, I want you to stay here and oversee the work of the church in Ephesus. And after doing that, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy to instruct and encourage him there. He wanted to give him exhortation and really to build up his, his courage as he did this work. And since Paul was likely released from prison about 61 AD, this letter was likely written 62 or 63. And then he wrote Titus after that, and 2 Timothy is the last letter that we have of Paul, um, written near the end of his life. Now, there's really several specific reasons that Paul wrote this letter to 1 Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor, and he's described as timid in 2 Timothy 1.7. And he would not have been naturally embraced by Jews or Greeks based on his uh, parentage. So he was facing kind of an uphill battle there in Ephesus. In addition, the city of Ephesus was a large worldly city with a lot of opposition. They had the Temple of Diana there, and were a very worldly city. So Paul really wanted to instruct and encourage Timothy as he led the church there. And we can find a, a sort of a purpose statement in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So 1 Timothy is a handbook for life in the church. It helps us to understand how we are to relate with other people. 
First Timothy teaches us how to think about officials in the government, the role of men and women in the leadership of the church, qualifications for elders and deacons, our relationships with men and women, young and old, how to help widows in the body, how to treat elders, how to live in the body, whether you are a slave or a rich person. So it, it deals with a lot of interpersonal relationships. How, do, how does this relationship work? What should we do with this? How do we think about this area of life? So Timothy, 1 Timothy was written to address a variety of topics. But one reason stands out for why Paul kind of was prompted to write this letter to Timothy, and that is false teaching. In Acts chapter 20, when Paul was leaving Ephesus on his third missionary journey, he gave a charge to the Ephesian elders to say, if you don't watch out, well, not even if you don't watch out, he's saying, watch out because wolves will come in to the flock. That was about 10 years before the writing of 1 Timothy, and in those 10 years, false teachers had come in. And these false teachers are introduced in 1 Timothy 1.3. It says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And then verse 6, Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So these are people who taught different doctrine, and they're concerned with myths and genealogies and speculations, and they misused the law. And chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, adds that they were preaching asceticism. They were saying you need to abstain from marriage and from eating certain foods. They had to obey these extra rules in order to keep themselves pure. And then chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 tells us that these false teachers craved controversy and even used their so-called godliness for their own personal gain. Really, they were trying to manipulate the system to benefit financially, and that was their motivation. And this false teaching seems to be similar to what Paul addressed in Colossians, which is a form of Judaism apply, misapplied, misapplying the law to believers. And this false teaching said that the believers had to obey portions of the law in order to be saved, especially areas like abstaining from certain foods or from marriage, as we saw in uh, chapter 4. And they tried to teach the law, but they didn't understand it. And so the result of their teaching was just to stir up controversy and division. So these false teachers were an issue that Paul wanted to address and teach Timothy how to counteract them and expose them for what they were. And Paul really answers the false teaching with the gospel. He says that the Judaizers', Judaizers misuse of the law really needs to be corrected to say that's not what the law is meant to do. In chapter 1, he says, the law is good if you use it lawfully, and that lawful use is to convict of sin. The law is not meant to be obeyed unto salvation. It's meant to show us how, how short we fall from God's holy standard and then lead us to the cross. So Paul walks through that grace that he himself received, not by obeying the law, but as the law pointed him to grace. In chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul is kind of even comparing himself to these Judaizers, saying, I used to do that too, but I realized it was wrong. I was convicted of my own sin, and God in his mercy and his grace led me to the cross and saved me. So I, Paul, and the foremost of sinners, and yet these false teachers, they actually need the gospel too. So I want to show you how they're wrong in misinterpreting the gospel, but I also want you to give the gospel to them, because if God can save someone like me, Paul, he can save these false teachers as well. So Paul uses the gospel to answer these false teachers, and throughout the book, he also uses the gospel to exhort Timothy in his walk with Christ. The gospel is really central, both in answering these false teachers and in all of the instruction Paul gives to Timothy. In chapter 1, verse 16, 
Paul says that he received mercy so that his life could be an example of someone who was following Christ. He said, God gave me this grace and enabled me to obey. And in that same way, Paul wants Timothy to use the grace that God has given him to obey and set an example for the people in Ephesus. He used the gospel to call Timothy to follow Christ. And there's many examples of this through the book. I want to just read one briefly, and that's in 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16. Paul says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So he's charging him to do all these things and then saying, do this in light of your conversion, the faith that you initially professed. Then verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, so he's reminding him about Christ's faithfulness, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he reminds him of Christ's return. And then 15, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And so this passage is filled with exhortation for, for Timothy to do, to follow Christ, and yet it's filled and immersed and even probably over, overflowing with this depiction of God in his glory, in his salvation, in uh, his return. And so P Paul is really using the gospel as a motivation for Timothy to obey. You could say that the message of the letter of 1 Timothy is that the gospel leads to godliness. The gospel leads to godliness. And this means that we need to know what the true gospel is as opposed to false teaching, which is why Paul spends so much time identifying the false teaching and debunking it. But it also means that our conduct really matters. And it's the necessary result and fruit of the gospel in our lives because the gospel leads to godliness. And there's an interesting dichotomy that Paul brings together in 1 Timothy 4.16. He says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. So he says, watch yourself and your teaching. And he means watch your conduct, the way that you live, and watch your teaching, the doctrine that you have. He brings doctrine and conduct together. He doesn't separate them and pit them against each other. So we can't be people who reject stale doctrine in order just to love people. That's not what Scripture teaches. We also can't be people who care more about understanding Scripture than applying Scripture. We need to bring them together and care about our conduct and our doctrine. That's really essential, and that's the message of 1 Timothy. So 1 Timothy is really convicting and encouraging for pastors and the exhortation that it gives and the gospel that it presents and holds out for hope and encouragement. And it's, it's helpful for all believers to see what that instruction to elders is and also what instruction applies to every believer in the church. It's a very helpful book, but 1 Timothy is also a somewhat confusing book. There are a higher than normal uh, number of passages that are somewhat, you could call them sticky. They're, they contain difficult concepts, difficult issues that require some extra attention. And what we've done in our Sunday school class normally is give the overview and kind of theme and main message of each book and show how it fits in Scripture, and then spend a little bit of time addressing any difficult parts in the book. This is kind of flipped, where there's so many difficult parts or even phrases that could mean a lot of different things that can cause confusion. We're actually going to spend the rest of our time just unpacking those things. And I, I don't remember how many I have, but it's it's probably closer to 10 than not. So we're just going to kind of go through these very briefly. We won't be able to give time to any of them that they really deserve. But there's enough things where, as you're reading down, if you looked at something and said, that seems odd, that we wanted to address without just leaving you confused. So let's look through the book. First of all, in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul mentions homosexuality, and he calls it a sin. 
And this verse is important because there's only a few verses in Scripture that actually specifically address homosexuality and categorize it as a sin. And because there's so few, there are a lot of attempts by people um, outside the church to reinterpret these and say they're not really condemning uh, a faithful relationship that, in homo- that is homosexual in nature. It's talking about something else. So it's important to understand what these verses are actually saying. And in this verse, Paul uses a word that he also uses in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And it's a word that Paul probably coined himself. It's a combination of two Greek words, one for man and one for bed. And you can get the connotations there. And it's a direct reference to Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, where those two words are used in conjunction with each other to condemn homosexuality. Paul just brings them together into one word that identifies the concept that he's talking about. And by combining these two words in 1 Timothy, we can deduce that those commands in Leviticus are actually still applicable today. They weren't just things that were meant for the specific tribe of Israel um, in their backward civilization that God has since moved on from. It's really really Paul giving credence to say, yeah, that condemnation is actually still God's desire for today. These are eternal commands that reflect God's views on homosexuality. And so it's important to know that First of all, Paul categorizes this as a sin in 1 Timothy, and that this reference also gives credence to what we see in the book of Leviticus as well. Next, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we find a command to pray for our leaders, for our elected officials. I'll read verses 1 and 2. He says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So this one isn't as hard to understand as it is maybe difficult to apply in our lives, to want to do this. Politics are really messy, and thinking through and interacting with politics as a believer is is really difficult. It's not easy. But what isn't difficult is understanding this Uh, command to pray for our leaders. That's really specific. And so this means that we should pray for President Trump, whether you're a supporter or not. We should pray for our governor, Laura Kelly, and our senators, Jerry Moran and Pat Roberts, and for other elected officials, both here in Kansas, in the United States of America. And it doesn't just say in this passage to pray for your elected officials. It says for kings, for leaders. So this really refers worldwide. Paul is asking us to pray for the leaders that God has sovereignly ordained to govern, which is a God-given right, and he's asking them to pray for justice, for them to uphold the good and punish evil, so that, as he says, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So we're to pray for these people as they take on these very difficult tasks, and the thought struck me, this is, this is a very convicting uh, command to me, that if every time that we saw a news story with someone, uh, one of our officials or leaders in the country, if we, what, what would happen if we prayed for them, rather than just consuming information, taking the story, or spinning it however we would want? And if you did that, I can guarantee that you're going to have a very prayerful 2020 as we go through another election cycle. So this is hard because politics becomes very polarizing, and it often feels like you're praying for your enemies, but it's really important for us to follow this command. As I said, it's very clear in Scripture. And by the way, if if you find it difficult to pray for certain officials today, remember that the emperor at the time of this writing was Nero, who was one of the most prolific opponents of Christianity in all history. So Paul wasn't asking Timothy to pray for someone that he really supported. He was saying, even at the worst, we need to lift these people up as they govern us. So we should pray for these leaders as they lead, that they maintain justice and punish wickedness. But we should also pray that these leaders be saved. And we see that in verses 3 and 4 where he follows his command by saying, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So he's saying, pray for these leaders because God is pleased with it and he desires these leaders to come to faith. 
So what, what a better way to influence the political landscape of our country over the next year than by praying for these officials to be saved. That's an opportunity that we have as believers and a, a command that we should follow. All right, next, in chapter 2, verse 6, and also in chapter 4, verse 10, uh, it sounds like Paul is teaching a form of universalism, that everyone will be saved. So this is one of the, a couple of those verses that just jump off the page and say, wait, what is he saying there? So let me read 2, 5, and 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And then in 4.10, he says, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So it sounds as if Paul is saying that God, that Christ gave himself as a sacrifice for everyone, so they'll be saved, and that he is the Savior of all people, regardless. But this isn't the case. If you just read these verses in isolation, you might get there. But that's in, that goes against all of the rest of Scripture, which talks about um, salvation coming to those who believe in Jesus Christ and repent of their sin. And there's clear descriptions in the rest of Scripture that talk about the punishment and condemnation coming for those who reject Christ. So one verse can't overturn the entire testimony of Scripture. If it disagrees with that, we have to say, okay, maybe I'm misunderstanding what this verse is actually saying. These verses are actually speaking about who can be ransomed and who can be saved, not who will. He's not saying that all people will be saved. He's saying all people can be saved. That the ransom that Christ gave was available to anyone, which actually goes right against the false teachers. And I think that's why he says this. The false teachers were adding these restrictions to the Gentiles and prioritizing the Jews. And Paul is saying, no, you can't do that. The ransom is for all, for Jew and for Gentile. And in verse 7, in chapter 2, he actually mentions, I think intentionally, to kind of get the, the false teachers, he says, I was sent to teach the Gentiles. So he's really saying that the ransom for all means that all can be ransomed. There's no distinction. And then in chapter 4, when he says that Christ is the Savior of all, he's repeating the same logic. And he's actually following a section in chapter 4 that also talks about the false teachers. He's saying that the gospel can extend to all people and even these false teachers. He's holding out the gospel to them to say, yes, even though these people are opposing the truth and they're antagonistic to the, the gospel, Christ is the Savior of all people, that he can save even them. So these references aren't saying who will be saved. They're saying who can be saved. Next, in chapter 2, there's a lot of sticky things in chapter 2. I think there's four or five that I've listed. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it seems to say that women can't wear braided hair or jewelry. And in verses 9 and 10, it says, Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. So when I was in middle school, I had a friend who read this and thought that it meant that women should not wear makeup or jewelry at all. And he told me that when he got married, he wouldn't let his wife wear any and that he would love her because she was ugly. And that's not what this means. (laughs) That is not what this means. So if you, ladies, he's not married. (laughs) If you came to church today with a braid in your hair or with gold or a pearl, I don't think that you're in sin. I don't think that's what this passage is saying. Paul says to adorn yourself in respectable apparel. And then he calls that apparel modesty and self-control and good works. He's saying that if you are a follower of Christ, you should be known for your godliness, not for your appearance. At issue is where you are drawing your attention. So that's what is at issue here, not whether you came with a braid or with a gold earring. So then fifth, Paul goes on in teaching, and in verses 11 through 14, he teaches on the role of women in the church. And this one is somewhat straightforward, but a very difficult and touchy issue. So we want to mention this this morning. So verse 11 says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. 
And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So the command in verse 12 is straightforward. Women may not teach or exercise authority over a man. And we know that this is in the context of the church specifically. This isn't just a general command that all women have to submit to all men. He's saying that in the church, women should not teach or exercise authority. And we know that because there are examples of women teaching in other contexts in the New Testament. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and a wife, taught a man named Apollos in Acts 18. So this teaching is something that occurs specifically in the church. And he's saying that when the church is gathered, women are not permitted to preach and thus exercise authority over the congregation. And this is rooted in creation, as verses 13 and 14 show. Paul is not making up these rules arbitrarily, and he's not enforcing the patriarchy of his day into the church. He's not doing that. He's showing that God created Adam and Eve with different functions. Though they're equal in nature, they have different functions. The man was designed to lead and the woman to submit, and these roles were flipped at the fall, where Satan tempted Eve, who then took the lead while Adam submitted to her. So at the fall, these roles were reversed. In the church, however, men and women are to follow God's design for their function um, that they were designed to fulfill. And so while the command is somewhat straightforward in how to understand it, it's very difficult to apply in our day because this is not popular. And there are many objections to what this text says. One objection is that if we say men and women are equal, then they must be given all the same opportunities. If they have different functions, if we say, if we restrict it and say, well, men can do these things, but women can't do this, the objection is, well, then they're not really equal they're, if they don't have the same function. But it's a misnomer that having different functions means different, that you're not equal. You can be equal in standing or in nature and different in function. And you can just think of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all co-equal in their deity and in their nature. There's no difference or distinction there. And yet their function is very different. Although Jesus was equal with the Father, he submitted to the Father's will and came to earth to die on the cross. Their function was different, and the Son's function was even one of submission. And yet that does not mean that he is, of a, that he is lesser than God the Father. It doesn't mean that at all. So just because the function of women differs from men in the leadership of the church, it doesn't mean that they are less in any way. Another obje objection is that these verses actually don't teach that women can't preach or teach. It just means they can't be elders. And those two words that they're not meant to teach or have authority, some equate that with the office of elder, which is uh, designated in chapter 3 right following it. So they're saying Paul is not objecting to gifted women teaching in the church. He just says they can't be elders. And so we should allow for women to preach, if they're gifted, under the authority and oversight of a pastor. So many, many are pushing this and, and hopeful for this, but I think this is unconvincing. First of all, because 1 Timothy 2.12 does not say women can't be elders. It say they're not permitted to teach or exercise authority. So those who interpret this verse seem to be letting a desire to have women preach drive their interpretation rather than letting the text speak for itself in what it says. And then the last objection to this verse is actually one that's worth considering. Because often in the discussion of the role of women in the church, the emphasis is, is on what women cannot do. It's all about the no's. And when you read this verse, we do have to talk about that because that's what Paul says. But the reality is that outside of this verse, in the rest of the New Testament, we find an abundance of yeses for the function of women in the church. So we want to be clear on what this verse says, but it also often flavors the conversation in a way that just seems to be always saying no, and that's not the testimony of Scripture. Women can serve and encourage and speak the truth in love. They fulfill every one another command that Scripture gives to believers. And God does not only equip men to build up the body, but really the church needs men and women. Um, to use the example from 1 Corinthians 12, if we just had men, we would be lacking half of the, the body. And that would not be good to have a bunch of ears and hands and noses running around without anything else. At Redemption Hill, we have women who serve in the nursery, in children's 
uh, Sunday school in our children's church, on our setup team, in greeting, on our tech team, and in music. We have women read the scripture in our Christmas Eve and darkening services. They participate in the process of church discipline, and they contribute as much as any other member of a small group. So while we do want to be clear on the, the no this scripture gives as far as the function of women in leadership, we also want to be clear on the abundance of yeses that scripture does give to women. Um, and we practice that here at Redemption Hill. All right, we're run, low on time, so we're going to try to go through these last ones quickly. That was kind of the biggest one that time-wise we're going to spend on, so hopefully we can make through this. Uh, next, in chapter 2, verse 15, it seems to say that women are saved by giving birth. If you were to read this verse quickly, you could see, uh, I'll just read it. It says, Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. See, the phrase is, she will be saved through childbearing. But this does not mean that only women who have kids can be saved. Or that childbirth is a means for salvation. That's not what this verse means. In one sense, this verse is talking about the redemption from the curse that women received at the fall. One curse for women was the, the pain in childbirth that would come. And Paul points out how salvation actually came through this curse. The birth of Jesus Christ came through the birth pangs of Mary. And so in that sense, the curse is the means for salvation to enter into the world. That's one thing that Paul is getting at. But in another sense, I think he's actually saying that women will be saved in spite of this curse. The word through, women will be saved through childbearing, it can refer to means, like how we're saved by grace through faith. That's how it's applied to us. But it can also mean in spite of. So like in 1 Corinthians 3, when it says that they will be saved through fire, it doesn't mean that fire is what is saving them. It's saying they'll be saved even though they come through the fire. And I think that's what Paul is saying here, that although women still bear the curse of pain and childbearing, in spite of that, salvation is still available, and that curse can be reversed. So if you do not have any children, your salvation is not at stake. <laughs> well, next, in chapter 3, Paul gives us the qualifications for elders and for deacons. And I wish we could get into the qualifications for elders. This chapter is really important for uh, instituting elders and deacons in the church. We shouldn't overlook it, but I just want to summarize what the qualifications are. It comes down to being above reproach and being able to teach. The majority of these qualifications for elders are their character, that they're blameless and accusations don't stick to them. The one ability they need to have is that ability to teach, but the rest have to do with their character and the way that they live their lives. And then also in chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, Paul gives some instructions on how to compensate elders, to handle accusations against them, basically how to take care of the elders in the church. So this is a really important book for the elders. But instead of the elders, I want to focus briefly on, on one statement that he makes about the qualifications for deacons, who are the, the servant leaders in the church. And in verse uh, 11 of chapter 3, Paul says, Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. And so this verse 11 comes in the middle of the qualifications for deacons. And verse 11 inserts the qualification for their wives. But in Greek, the word here can mean the women or their wives. So some people take this to say that verse 11 is the qualification for the female deacons, not for the wives of the male deacons. And this is a possible interpretation. This is a legitimate way to translate uh, what the Greek says. And many people that I respect uh, hold this position, but I, I don't think it's the best way to read the text that it's referring to female deacons. Uh, it would be odd to describe the qualifications for men and then for women and then go back to men in the same section. It doesn't seem like a very linear argument. And then, in addition, the word men is not mentioned in parallel with women. It's not saying the male deacon should be this way, the female deacon should be this way. It just refers to the deacons. So there's no specification of male deacons and female deacons. But lastly, although the, the deacon does not teach and preach in the church and thus exercise that authority, it is still a position of authority and servant leadership in the church. 
So based on what Paul has said in chapter 2, it seems that since women are not permitted to exercise authority in that way, that also applies to the office of deacon. So again, that's something that good people disagree on, and that's okay. I think there's reasons to think that it's not referring to female deacons, but that's not a gospel issue. All right, we're going to skip down to chapter 5 now. Chapter 4 deals a lot with the false teachers. But in chapter 5, Paul gives a lot of specifics on how to care for widows in the church. And verse 3 gives the summary of the entire section. He says, honor widows who are truly widows. And that's really, if you had to summarize everything he was saying, that's the key. It describes the qualifications for widows who need care from the church. Widows in the first century were left without means to care for themselves. So if they couldn't be cared for... If they couldn't be cared for by their family, and if they were older and faithful followers of Christ, Paul outlines how to take care of them. And we can't look at all the specifics now, but this chapter really lays the groundwork for determining how to help people in the church, for determining who really is in need, and how the church is to apportion the, the limited means that the church has. We're meant to be generous and to give, and this doesn't put a hold on that. But the reality is that we don't have unlimited means, and we do have to use discernment. And so this chapter provides a lot of wisdom and instruction for how to parcel that out. Next, in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, there's a section where Paul commands believing slaves how they are to act. And in these verses, Paul tells believers who were slaves to honor and obey their masters for the glory of God. And those who served believing masters were to serve all the more out of love for their brothers in Christ. So this would have been a touchy situation. We've heard from Philemon and and J.D. has preached through this in Colossians. Paul is actually focusing more on the slave's relationship with God and their relationship with other believers than in their situation as a slave. And he's saying it's more important for how you behave as a follower of Christ than whether you are free or not. But I would really recommend you go back and listen to J.D.'s sermon, The Supremacy of Christ Over Slaves and Masters, which is on our website, which goes a lot deeper into the relationship of slavery in the church that we just can't unpack this morning. All right, and then the last verse that just sounds odd and kind of raises some questions in our mind is in chapter 6, verse 10. It seems to say that the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's a common phrase in the world that I think a lot of people know outside of the church. There was a point in my life where I actually thought this was one of the things that Ben Franklin had said, where it was kind of pithy and had a lot of wisdom, but like that doesn't sound biblical. That sounds odd. And it seems to contradict the theology of sin that we see throughout the rest of Scripture. It seems like pride or unbelief were the sins that prompted Adam and Eve to disobey God. And money wasn't there in the garden, So how is money the root of all evil? And here the ESV is really helpful. And probably the translation that you have says it similar to this. That it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The Greek word here for evil is plural. So it's evils. It's not just the root of evil as an entity. And this translation really accurately translates what the Greek is saying here. And I think the King James is the only major translation that takes it as is the root of all evil. Almost every other major translation says all kinds of evil. So what Paul is saying is that he's not saying that all evil can be traced back to money. He's saying that an inordinate love for money is one of the biggest reasons that people sin and commit these evils. So he's not labeling it as the root of everything. He's saying that it is a significant root of a lot of things. Clarification there. All right, and that brings us to the end of the whirlwind tour through 1 Timothy. So hopefully I didn't raise more questions about these passages, but I didn't want to go through these things and mention things like, yeah, Christ is the Savior of the world, and then leave you thinking, wait, does that mean he saved everybody? I thought we didn't believe that. So if, you, if your interest was piqued on these things, look into it more. And don't just settle for a couple minutes here on Sunday morning. But it, it is worth it to look into these difficult issues. Like First, or First Timothy 4.16 said, we must pay attention both to our conduct and to our doctrine. So it's important that we understand the truth of First Timothy, first to know what it says, but also so that we can have right practice, so that we can follow God correctly, so that our gospel can lead to our godliness. And as Paul says 
to Timothy in chapter 6, verse 20, we must guard the deposit that is entrusted to us. So I hope this, the time this morning was helpful as you guard that deposit. You're dismissed.